April 26, 2005. A bridge across the River Elid has been constructed. Yet another signal of the warming relations between the Caridians and the Menavites, opening up even more areas in the vast desert sands. West of the river lies Menaphos, the Menaphite capital, a city of great wealth, knowledge, and culture. Adjoining Menaphos on the eastern side of the river lies Sophonim, the city of the dead, where the Menaphites erect great pyramids in honor of their fallen. For now, exploring Menaphos will have to wait. Both cities are heavily guarded. But perhaps a wily adventurer may find a way to sneak into Sophonim. A strange wanderer to the northeast of the cities claims to know of a secret entrance. But beware, she seems to have some ulterior motives. The start of this desert storyline begins with our adventurer speaking to a strange wanderer. After finding out she has an odd aversion to cats, you become hypnotized by this woman and wake up inside of the city walls. A quick check of your inventory reveals an oddly shaped jar. Following this, you touch a pyramid door and a strange flashback occurs of you stumbling around the pyramid and solving a puzzle. When this ends, you find a sphinx who decides to tell you about the history of the Menophyte Pantheon in its entirety. Get ready for this one. So the history includes two gods, two demigods, and four lesser gods. The two main gods are Temekin and Elodinus. Amazingly, even though Temekin is the head honcho god, he is the only one without a depiction. Anyways, Temekin and Elodinus are husband and wife, with Temekin being the god of the sun and Elodinus being the goddess of fertility and growth. You'll notice the river Elid was named after her. Next up, we have their two kids. Ichthorin and Amasket, also known as the Devourer. Ichthorin is the god of the dead and carries souls from one plane to the next. Amasket used to be the goddess of rebirth, but towards the end of the Second Age, she began to change. Instead of guiding souls to rebirth, she started devouring them instead. It was then that she renamed herself as the Devourer, goddess of destruction. This was in direct opposition to her brother, and the two of them have been locked in a rivalry ever since. Finally, we have the Lesser Gods. All four of these Lesser Gods were made by the subconscious of Temekin as he had four dreams over the course of four days. Three of those dreams were good, one was bad. The one nightmare that he had was about loneliness, and so Scabarus, the god of isolation, was born. The other three Lesser Gods are at Mekin, the goddess of mental pleasure, Krondus, the goddess of physical pleasure, and Het, the god of physical and mental health. Did you get all that? Good. Let's move on. After this long conversation, the Sphinx tells you about the mysterious jar in your inventory and that you had stolen it from the temple you went into. The jar has literal remains inside of it as well as the soul of the dead high priest, Clenter, whose ghost just so happens to be chilling out over here. Clenter's soul is important for unknown reasons, besides the fact that a masket really wants to devour it. The Sphinx says you should talk to the current high priest, so let's stop and say hello to Clenter on our way. Why is it getting dark? Return the jar. Oh my. Return the jar, or suffer my curse. I'll get right on that. After that lovely experience, we go to the high priest, and he says that indeed the plagues happening in town are because of our theft of the jar, and that we should probably put it back. You re-enter the pyramid and have another flashback. Entering the tomb, you see yourself picking up one of the jars and fighting a manifestation of one of the four lesser gods. You defeat it, and the flashback ends. Knowing now that you have in fact stolen the jar, you feel regret and put the jar back where you found it. You leave the pyramid and speak with Clenter one more time as he says he'll stop the plagues. Spoiler, he doesn't. After you talk to the new high priest, he says they need to do one more ritual for Clenter in the pyramid. Following this, you have another flashback of you putting an unholy symbol inside the room that they're about to do the ritual, allowing a masket to teleport there. So, you race to the room and warn them, but it's too late as a masket has already made it there and ends up mind-controlling one of the priests, who then tries to kill you. Instead, you kill the priest and save the day. Except not really, because the plague is still going on and nothing has gotten any better. Talking with the priest one more time, you're left puzzled as to why you were taken out of the hypnotic state in the first place. It's at this point where you have your final flashback of you nearly leaving the temple with the stolen jar as Ichthorin himself shows up to stop you. He notices that you've been hypnotized and lifts the spell as you stumble outside of the the pyramid. And that is the end of that story. Except it's not. There's actually a huge bit of lore that you're likely to miss if you aren't looking for it. After the quest is done, you now have the ability to talk to cats with the Catspeak amulet. One cat in particular you should talk to is Neat. 
You'll most likely know Neat from A Tale of Two Cats, as she ends up being Bob's girlfriend. Not only will you find out details of far-off quests such as Dragon Slayer 2, but you'll also find out that she was once human and a worshipper of a mascot. However, a mascot never discriminated in her destruction, and would even destroy and consume her own followers and temples. This caused Neat and the other followers to rise up against her and curse her for eternity. Never again would a mascot's name be willingly worshipped, as she was to be forgotten. In addition to this, she would not be able to possess any host for a prolonged period of time. In retaliation, a mascot set out her own curse, condemning Neat and the other followers to resemble her true form. It is because of this line we can assume a mascot's true form is that of a cat-like creature, which makes sense because her brother Ikl resembles the likeness of a dog. The player then asks why a mascot is afraid of cats, since she used to look like them. Neat states, because the few remaining of us still possess some degree of the power she gave us. Then surely all she has to do is wait until you all die of natural causes. It's not in Ikhlaren's best interest to let us die, so we will never die of natural causes. Oh, it must be a bit of a drag just hanging around. Spite sustains me. It has been a while. Let's check in with the High Priest and see how things are going in the City of the Dead. Turns out, not the best. They're still in an ongoing fight with a mascot over Clenter's soul, and to make matters worse, Menaphos won't lift the quarantine that has been imposed on Sophonim, even though the plague is not contagious. After being told that they were all refused entry, the High Priest tells you that a large number of townfolk are still in Menaphos and that we must give them word that it is safe to return to Sophonim. So we had to plan to go underground as the High Priest says that followers of Scabarus had a plan to make a passage under the river of Elid, but the goddess Elidina smited them in their actions. Which I'm very happy she did so, because the last thing that I want to do is go through another underground pass. The priest tells you to talk to this guy, Jax, who informs us of the dangers that await inside of the Scarab Dungeon. You, of course, don't care and decide to go anyway. After traversing through the maze-like cave, you come upon a dead man with a note on him. The note reads, Your mission is to contact our agent inside Menaphos. Use the tunnels beneath the Temple of Lesser Gods. Be vigilant of traps and the hostile natives. They're about as welcoming as the Menaphites, only slightly better looking. Putting the note down, we find a girl named Misa in the caves who's upset at Khalif's death since he was supposed to guide her out of Menaphos. She demands to see the Alcarid spy Osman, who was the one that sent Khalif to begin with. You speak with Osman as he says he does not wish to go to Sophonim with you, because he has bad blood in the region. Apparently, the kingdom of Alcarid and Menaphos were at war for centuries, as Menaphos tried to expand their kingdom northward many times. However, the Alcarid kingdom were able to hold them off every time, and now the two areas have a temporary peace. Finally, we're able to convince Osman to go to Sophonim by telling him that we could drive a wedge between the two conjoining cities. We would do this because if word got out that the people of Sophonim were helped by the people of Alcarid, it would anger the people of Menaphos, therefore giving Alcarid more leverage over Sophonim. It's a pretty sleazy thing to do, but Osman is all for it as we decide to both head to the cities. We get an amazing cutscene of Osman doing some spy work, but after waiting for around two hours for him to come back, we get worried and decide to go look for him. After stumbling around the maze again, you find Osman and Misa conversing with one another on getting the people of Sophonim out of Menaphos. It's at this point that a strange rumble occurs and a scarab creature forms. It appears to immediately injure Osman, so we rush down there and try and take it out. With our trusty Ivan's staff, we make quick work of the Scarab while tanking his three minions. Osman reappears and tells the player that his work is done here and that he should probably take the dagger that the Scarab dropped. One last time, we head back to the priest and inform him that the people of Sophonim have made it back home safely. And that just about wraps it up. Or does it? Apparently, rumors have escaped of strange happenings inside Menaphos, and there are stories of citizens mysteriously disappearing. You might want to check with Jamila at the crafting stall. It seems she may know something. Looks like this desert story is about to get another chapter. <laughs>